Oh my gosh, so excited. Matt Kowalski, I, I have been following you for, oh my gosh, I think three years. It's been awesome. And you have just an incredible um, bio. I was reading your bio, but I have been just a super fan for the last couple of years watching you. You're a filmpreneur, film trepreneur, if that's how I say it right. Um, documentary filmmaker. You've done some incredible things. I don't know how we became connected, but when I was watching you over the last few years, I'm like, wow, this guy is in the thick of it. And obviously we had an incredible 2020 and you were in the middle of all of it. So to all of our listeners and people watching, Matt Kowalski, welcome to the show. Thank you. And I don't think it's even mattered uh, how we connect. It's matters that it matters that we are connected. So thank you so much for uh, having me on the show. And I, I watch you too, and you're killing it. Uh, love the attitude. I love the confidence. And, uh, you know, I just feel good about goal searching when I see your, or, you know, fighting for goals. So you're doing a great job as well. Um, yeah, 2020 was crazy. Um, I guess, can I give you maybe just a, a small little bit of background to where, where I became with all this? Okay. Um, so always been a TV movie fan, latchkey kid, uh, I guess I'm Gen X, so kind of grew up with the TV. Yeah. And um, so I uh, also really like journalism, uh, Hunter S. Thompson, stuff like that. So um, I went to college. Um, I guess I graduated in like 2005 for filmmaking and journalism. And I ended up uh, for three years working with a court reporting firm uh, doing video. So it's like testimony and you've got attorneys and this and that for three years. So I developed a kind of a very objective um, style of just, you know, centering the image, giving everyone respect that witness, you know, making sure, Hey, there's a water bottle in front of you. Maybe that doesn't look good. So I come from kind of the, the, the image part of it. Um, so then to uh, fast forward and come into the journalism thing, I've been doing that for six years. Uh, my first story was a uh, veteran's suicide, 23 per day. Uh, was, wow. And that was 2015, I did that story. And then that took me into presidential rallies, um, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders, Trump, uh, Hillary Clinton, and then police shootings, um, the Philando Castile story, I, I, I was able to, to cover that. Um, later, George Floyd. Um, in the beginning uh, of 2020, it was uh, lockdown protests. Um, so that's when I first really uh, came into 2020 on that. And I actually, interesting enough, I, I actually got horrible messages for that, like saying that people wish that I would die of COVID and this and that because I was out there covering those lockdown things. Um, and so it was a weird time. And I think propaganda was firing everyone up. And then what the government was doing um, as a journalist, and see, I knew there would be backlash. So, I mean, I pretty much saw it coming and thought I would have a pretty busy year. Uh, no one really saw, I think, the George Floyd uh, video coming. And then this also took me, and again, I'll, I'll finish this overview here. This also took me to Kenosha, Wisconsin um with the uh, the written house and the the jacob uh blakely i want to say his last name was uh, the man that was shot and then <laughs> lo and behold uh dc you know i was there actually the day after the january 6th uh, insurrection but i had other uh members of my team there covering that and then the inauguration um and for me uh it's kind of ended a little bit. I'm going to take a break from the journalism thing right now, now that the Chauvin uh, verdict is there. And I have uh, one of my team kind of covering my stuff. And I'm going to go back into more the uh, the corporate advertising uh, filmmaking thing. But as you said, film entrepreneur, you pronounced it perfectly. It's just film and entrepreneurship. And I really just make uh, my living making films, is essentially. I love okay. it. Well, the reason I had you on the show is obviously 2020 I was watching through you a very non-biased reporting, which is important. And, and I'm not here to put a judgment on the media right now. It's not like the media is this or that. What I want to talk about is your type of reporting was what I watched. And it's really important for people to know that why I'm highlighting you is because we need more you. Okay. We need more mats. Right. Okay. And I, I think I get why you're taking a break. You just were in the thick of probably everything of five years. So in five years, now you're in Minnesota, correct? 
Yes. So I'm in Minnesota. You're in Minnesota. You have been involved in quite a few things recently. And then, you know, we talked about the, the Castile shooting as well. So we have, we have what happened kind of kicked off this whoa. And in Minnesota, if you live here and you understand the Twin Cities, it was really rough. You know, we, we went through that time and it kind of was the Trump stuff was building. The election was so fiery. Let's let's start there because we're going to kind of progress. Trump. We don't need opinions, but when you're in the media and you're shooting this and you're in it, describe that experience on the campaign trail with with the wild stuff that was happening. You know, how did you feel as you were going through the campaign of 2016? You know that that presidential election. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Now you're making me think back to 2016. I was getting with uh, I was I was uh, I was kind of heavy into the Libertarian Party of Minnesota then. And I remember we were going to talk about that. And that's something I've served four terms as the executive director. I will not be seeking a fifth term. They're going to have their convention here. Uh, May 8th, get along uh, great with them. It was just a great, I'm, I'm really a better person for having been uh, served. And I think they're probably maybe a better party, you know, because of me being there too, you know, so it was a really good experience. So I was definitely watching the Gary Johnson stuff, uh, sure. who was the third party and actually did better than any libertarian. But I will say in 16, uh, with, uh, in 2016, with all the, the propaganda and stuff, you really, it seemed the narrative was, we have two things we don't like up top. And I think, you know, nobody really cared for Trump and nobody really cared for Hillary. And I think a lot of people probably even stayed home on the side of, of Democrats and, and kind of hung Hillary out to dry. And then when uh, we got Trump, I think the media just feasted. I mean, that was a story. I think there's a sociopathism to the media and that they kind of need to gaslight people and they sort of feed on your rage. And so I'm not saying I'm a fan of Trump. Like I said, I'm a, I'm a civil libertarian. Um, right. But I think, like you said, the opinion stuff does not help. And it makes us not look at each other like human beings. It makes us look at each other as sides. Mm -hmm. And that's where you, this fiery prop, we've seen it in history, haven't we? We've seen uh, in Germany when, in the 40s when propaganda got, we saw in uh, Italy with Mussolini, propaganda got a little out of control. We saw Rwanda, to be honest with right. you. And what I see from other countries using this propaganda is it's become the cool thing to hogpile on America and take away from, you know, maybe their, uh, their bad things to, to, to make um, America look so horrible. And when everyone just picks a side, it just adds to the, the, the flamage. And I think with my style is... Look, I'm just a human being out there. Like I had to take a step back because literally, like I cried probably three days in between my last job and that verdict because I was like, okay, I can feel now because I had to just like be working and, and stuff like that. And people treated me uh, with respect and I was in some very, you know, harsh situations. And I felt like the cops, the protesters, whatever they knew, I kind of looked like I should have been there. Okay, I was doing my job uh, the whole time. And, um, you know, I think if we just sit and watch the propaganda and not engage with people, uh, because with 2020, we didn't have a campaign season. Everybody was inside, right? Trump was doing rallies, but a lot of the stuff was on Zoom. So the biggest thing I hope is that I, I gave a human side to journalism. I respected the people I was filming. I wasn't doing gotcha doxing. I was framing them beautifully, in my opinion. And I just wanted to say, because... 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road, they're going to say, wow, what happened during that whole revolution in 2020? And there's a lot of opinions. Well, this guy just uh, set up a camera and you can think for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's what it, in my opinion, again, that's what it needs to be. And it's really important. And I think I really enjoyed what you just said because you brought a human part to a media, to the journalism. I mean, you, you shared with me something private, and but it was something very serious um, last week. And last week, you know, if you're listening and it's not real time, obviously the, show, the Chauvin trial and uh, what the verdict came in, or no, it was, yeah, last week. And it was heated. You know, you had journalists getting hurt, you know, mm -hmm. we, we want to bring a side to both sides, you know, you see all this other stuff, but there's a lot of things going on in the background. And you, you kind of, you showed people that world on your social media. That's why I started following you because you were showing this other side that 
you, you can't go on to a mainstream media outlet and see that you were showing the real stuff. And it was really important to see like, hey, these are, there's a lot of human beings involved here. This isn't just where the camera is. There's people behind the camera. There are people, business owners with their, their businesses on fire. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these peaceful protests were not peaceful. And, you know, it's okay to say the truth. I think the other thing I wanted to talk about as a journalist, as somebody who is, is in my opinion, very non-biased, who did a really good job, is it hard for you watching a narrative be pushed? Is it hard for you watching certain outlets do that when you are seeing it a different way? You know, I'm not trying to accuse, and I wanna be very careful on how we do this, but I, for me, it's hard to watch. For me, when I'm watching multiple different views and I'm like, well, why don't we just do the truth? And you're getting this little edge over here where you're like, whoa, that's not accurate because that isn't what I read or what you know is actually. How is it as a journalist when you're trying to show, when you're trying to do your job and you've got people playing on emotions, the propaganda and the narratives? How do you, how do you keep going as a journalist? Um, I think it's because I'm going to have the last word in a weird way. Like, I think I know that I'm looking at this from an aerial perspective and, and I think, um, you know, I, I think I have the real story. Um, the part that's frustrating about opinion journalism is some people don't realize they're watching opinion journalism um, with these networks and these cable news um, networks. Um, I know so much about propaganda because I've studied it and I'm like the, I guess I'm the anti Edward Bernays. And if you don't know who Edward Bernays is, he um, made smoking cool for women in like the fifties because he called them like Liberty cigarettes and um, nine out of 10 uh, doctors think you should have, you know, meat for breakfast. You know, that was like a scam to sell more eggs. So I think, I guess what I'm sad is like, not that we should censor anything, but people need to realize like we're human beings, like our brains like to, like to grab out its stimuli and we like to imitate. And, you know, there's just, when people just go on autopilot and don't think and just take someone else's word for it. But if you're not out there in the streets, I see how you could be confused about that because that's how it was for me until I actually got the, out there and, um, and realized. So you'll see, stories pop out on opinion news uh, outlets that uh, are debunked the next day. It wasn't fake news, but they maybe knew the truth and they wanted to fire it up and get, you know, people going. And then you'll have like this little fringe of people that are exposed to all that propaganda that snap and sell, you know, and they'll do like mail bombs, uh, whatever. I know we had, you know, someone shot up a baseball diamond and almost hit Ryan Paul or something like that. So there, there are consequences to like all this, uh, this hateful propaganda that goes around. Um, but I think the most important thing is people need to go, okay, what am I watching? And what is this trying to manipulate my mind to think and why? And I think if we are just better human beings in that respect, I'm okay with everything. Exactly. I like that. I like that perspective. Have you read the book Outwitting the Devil? Wrote that? No, Napoleon Hill. Oh, no, I have the Napoleon Hill Think and Grow Rich, I think. But no, I haven't. Oh, now I have to check that out. It's all about propaganda. The devil, he's interviewing the devil. It's actually, they believe that he actually did. It was a Oh, very, how have I not read that? That sounds It's a wonderful. very controversial book. It came out very late. Okay, it came out because they were scared to publish it. This is a cool story. I'll give you goosebumps. But let's just go to the short what? version of it. Talks about the devil talks about propaganda at a time where none of this stuff was out. Like he was talking about smoking and things like that. This was way before any of what you mentioned, because I do know what you're talking about. Um, propaganda is everywhere. Like we deal with it every day and, and they feed off your fear. It's fed off fear and emotion. And if you can tap into someone's fear and emotion, you've got them. You've got yep. them unless they, they, they can pull out of that and, and have like, it's, it, I don't want to say high EQ, like emotional intelligence, because I'm not, I'm not putting people down. I'm saying it's very easy when something touches, when it gets to that, that, um, that pain point, you can get somebody. It's gotten me. I had a complete meltdown last summer because everything was just piling up. And I was like, what's happening? And I knew better, but I just, it was so much at once. And, and we can find everybody. We're, we're wearing masks. We're stuck in our house. It was the perfect storm. And then we had George Floyd. And it was like, oh my gosh, not right now. But it was like, yes, right now. It was a, it, 
everything was pushed. I mean, there were the video was out before the rest of the video was out. You know, there were things, you know, people were so mad. It was over before it was over. And I'm not, I'm not putting a, I'm not giving my opinion on either side. I'm saying it was so crazy, so quick. And all this built up hundreds of years of anger and hurt and people were ready and you put them in a pressure cooker of the quarantine and all that. It was a perfect storm, but the propaganda is mind blowing. When I, when I, even when I turn on the news for a minute, I, I watch it and I'm like, that's not accurate, you know, because I have different outlets I go to because now I know because I finally got smart last year and I'm like, I'm no longer doing this. I got to go to sources that are actually just reporting and that's it. Um, but a lot of people don't understand that. And so I think it's really good that you mentioned like this is opinion journalism. People need to hear that from a journalist. <laughs> they need to hear it from somebody who's like, hey, I'm telling you what this is. Now it's our job, it's my job to, to filter that out and go, okay, that's an opinion piece. I need to look into this and stop looking at a meme on social media and stop reacting to every damn thing that happens because we're all reacting. And I finally had to just stop and I'm like, I'm done. Like I'm, I'm done. They're trying to get me to react good or bad and I'm not going to do it. And so we just have to stand up and do it. I, and I read something, someone posted somewhere, you know, if you were, if you ever wondered what people would do or why the Germans did what they did, you have your answer right now. There was so much propaganda back then. I'm a, I'm a passionate person about World War II history. Um, it's a passion. It's a secret passion of mine. It, it, it's to my heart because what happened was it should never happen again. But we're seeing it in China, so we're seeing it in, in, in it's happening. And we're we're sitting back again and we're going, well, that's over there. No, these are human beings. So so we have to be, we have to stay focused on being human and remembering that there's a lot of people right now hurting and it's not just i always say we're, we're we have champagne problems right we're first world champagne problems we have to remember that sometimes when we're we're, we're screaming about things that you know let's look at the bigger picture i think is really important nice. okay so i know you had a really emotional few weeks you know um the last few weeks have been really really emotional T tensions are high if you will, would you just talk about some of the last few weeks for you and, and what had, you know, you don't have to give details if you don't want to, but just the last few weeks of going through the Chauvin trial, watching it, reporting on it, you know, what was going on? What was going on through, you know, in your head, your team, you know, safety? What was it like down there? Yeah. So I've always felt called to do this work. I know that's weird. I'm not like overly religious or anything like that. And, uh, Near a few days before that, uh, that verdict, I was kind of like, okay, I don't think, I think I'm good. Like, I think I got everything I need to get for now. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, unfortunately, I mean, I've done it for six years, but the, the material got too popular, I, I think, for what we were doing, because um, what happened was I work with a news agency uh, in Germany and, you know, they send some people that I've ended up being friends with because Minneapolis has been the epicenter. So I've got that guy named Raphael and Edgar, they come and a lot of times they'll go live. I don't go live. I just make, you know, my documentary packages and it's a couple minutes that go out uh, to the world. And then I, I hoard the rest for hopefully a future documentary that I'm doing with my friend Mason. Um, and then speaking of Mason, he actually was with me in uh, January. Uh, he started coming along. And so he's going to take over kind of some of my stuff. But I was bringing him in at, you know, as this last week. And what happened was another one of my friends, I post a lot on Facebook, right? I think if you really want to see what I kind of have going on, probably if we're friends on Facebook, you see the most like versus any other social media or like the intimacy stuff. But I have other friends who are in this industry and some people were not welcome at some of these uh, protests because of the doxing and the opinionating and stuff. And so like, you talk about the propaganda and it's like, this is kind of weaponized in the sense that, yeah, you did, you only saw a part of George Floyd. And I'm trying to comment on a lot of things you're saying, but uh, the George Floyd thing, it was like, boom, it's on, weaponized propaganda. I got called oh, out to Wisconsin when that was happening because I was covering all this. And the first day, uh, the news desk sent me, in, and I saw the Jacob Leakley thing, and they sent me a Twitter video. 
and it's a cop getting hit in the face with a brick. Okay. That, that's what, and I looked at it and, you know, I got my son, you know, I would have had to make arrangements to go get a sitter for him or whatever. And I'm going to go there and I go, you know, no, you know, and I just, I didn't go. And then a couple of days later when the Kyle guy had shot that those people, they were like, okay, you need to get in here. And then we already had some in there. So I went in there and I was able to um, actually interview one of the, the, the shooting victim's girlfriends I actually got a nice exclusive out there and, and got to talk to her. But like, as I'm doing that in Minneapolis, some guy, there's a video of some guy getting shot in the head down in Minneapolis. And they're like, oh, the cops killed another one. Turns out this person had murdered someone else in a parking ramp. And uh, the video went out and boom, robotic. Like there is a robot thing going on with this. You know, I'm not saying that police accountability isn't a real thing, but how are they able to just boom and then the stores are hit? One of my friends was out reporting and had someone with them. And I think they had a bulletproof vest and a camera. They were robbed that night. And I don't think that person really came to a protest again after that. So now there's people kicked out of it. I'm kind of in there because I'm doing my humanistic journalism. People are respecting me. I'm kind of like a nature videographer. I'm sitting in the back and birds are, you know, flying, you know, landing on my shoulders and I'm cool, right? They're, you know, everyone's used to me. Um, and so my stuff and the people I work with stuff started getting bought by sensational outlets that certain movements were watching and just watching our cameras, waiting them for you to go to live. And the thinking behind that was that it was either sensational or, um, you know, something that would bring uh, like a Charlottesville type violence onto them. You get someone fired up, right? And Billy Bob grabs his car or whatever. But I started, what happened was Edgar got kicked out and confronted on camera you know, we got, we got this. Um, Raphael got hit because this other outlet was taking and, and he was out of it. And I noticed I started looking like when I, when I started going to that Brooklyn center stuff, I noticed it was like, I was, uh, you know, they were watching me looking for my feeds and stuff, but no one could figure it out. Cause I'm, you know, I'm a straight shooter. I always come. And so later on, I figure out, Oh, so they're like checking us and like floating our pictures around and stuff like that. And I'm just like, God, I just, uh, I just, I didn't like the feeling of it. And Mason was kind of broken already. And now Mason's kind of dealing with the aftermath of that still, because they're still checking out um, uh, lives and stuff like that. So look, I, 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 sometimes if you do your job correctly, it just doesn't matter because some, that other thing can come in and screw you up and get in your good standing. So I'm not uh, by any means quitting journalism, but that gave me a bad taste. And like, there was an edge at Brooklyn Center from the Dante Wright thing. There was different people that I didn't always see. And you know, that CNN guy, uh, old camera, he got like an ice bottle to his head and they drilled that. Um, so <laughs> I'm a big Fritz Lang fan and you talk about Germany and World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the best way I can finish this part out. Uh, Fritz Lang was brought in uh, by Goebbels to say, hey, Hitler saw your movies. We love it. We want you to make the national uh, socialist movie. You know, you're going to be it. You're going to be the guy in German film. And he's like, OK, great. So he went home, packed his stuff, jumped on a train and got the heck out of there. Right. And there was this harrowing story. Um, later on, William Freakin, I think he did The Exorcist, actually interviewed uh, Fritz Lang about his filmmaking and, and, and being, you know, really a Jew in that fascist thing and, and really just uh, having to flee for his life. And they talked about, you know, is that why some of your movies were so dark later in life? And he goes, look, and I say this, too, because I don't work with the Libertarian Party anymore. I'm not a politician. I'm a filmmaker. It's not my job to really fix this stuff, but I can, hopefully I can show you the social evils of our time. And maybe a politician will do about it, but I don't care what anyone says. A mob on both sides, that's what he said. The, so, the mob is a great social evil of our time. And the problem is with a mob, one person, uh, it doesn't matter. You get warned once or one thing goes wrong, it's a hog pile. Um, and I heard about that happening in Portland where like, you know, somebody, you know, people are getting beaten to death and stuff like this. So 
I just, it didn't feel as safe and it just felt really edgy. And I'm sure, like you said, it was because that Chauvin trial was so close that everyone was just kind of like losing your mind. You feel that energy out there. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Mason's going to still uh, continue that or whatever, but six years was good for me. Now I'm going to focus on some other filmmaking stuff and my story's not done. I'll still, I'll still cover it, but I need for like my mental health, like I need to take a break from that stuff. For sure. I agree. I think, well, everybody needs to take a break. I think it would be great if the media could shut off for like a week. <laughs> everybody just take a break I thought about it you know one thing that I noticed um in the last couple months I was watching I was looking on Netflix you know I'm looking for movies and I'm looking for I love documentaries by the way so it's fun that we're doing this but I love documentaries there is nothing happy I look if you look on Netflix it, look at how the whole world is putting us in this yucky place it's it's again there's no joy. It's all horror films, documentary, murders, murders, documentaries. Like, it, it, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when you don't bring this happy, like, there's no happiness. Like, we're yeah. all we're seeing, and we're just getting flooded with it. But there is good stuff. Like, take away all the the things we just talked about. There's really good things happening in the world still. There's still yeah. really good people out there. Like cops, there's still great cops. There's still great people. There's still lots of amazing things. And we have to really focus on that. But it's really hard if you keep people in front of a screen. And that's what people are doing. We're in front of, we're in front of our screens all day long. And so we have, to, we have to pull away from that. So I'm proud of you for taking a break. Like it's really good for you. Okay. Yeah, it had to be done, but thank yeah. you. Um, and if I could just add to something you said really quick, really quick yeah. about the screen. Yeah. There's like a Hippocrates Socratic conversation somewhere. Um, it was actually in the film, The Conformist, which is about Italian fascism. And they said there was a very sad thing because these prisoners or Neanderthals or whatever, they would sit in a cave and they would watch the, the shadows from the fire. They wouldn't watch the fire because they were in the cave of the prison. So they could only see the shadows in the darkness. To me, that's your screen. That's your prop. Right. People just trapped in front. They're not seeing the fire. They're seeing it perception as per someone else's perception of reality. That's what we got to get out of. Yeah, exactly. So let's talk about some joy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Babe, let, I want to hear this now. What has been so far, take out, take out some of the crazy stuff. What's been your favorite project you've ever done? And then I know you're do, working on some things. So what's in the future? But first, like, what's the best thing you think you've ever done project-wise or documentary-wise? Or, or if not yet, what's down the road? Yeah, I would say not yet, but I'm starting it. My my one of my favorite filmmakers is Stanley Kubrick, and he would take three or four years to to make a film. Six years I'm into this thing. I haven't really edited it. And I've got six years of footage. I mean, this I think will be probably my shot at a legacy. I hope um, you know, thirty years from now, maybe when this story goes, it's like you know, watching Malcolm X or JFK or, you know, Woodstock or something. I want it to be, you know, very iconic and say something. So that's definitely a labor of love. Um, you know, I've made narrative films uh, uh, and such. And um, I think, honestly, what I'm really excited to get back is uh, Rossman Construction, Boise Cascade. They were my uh, customers who were just like super patient when this was going on, like when the masks thing, like I would have projects for them. They're like, no, you need to be out there. You need to you need to get this history. Like so they understand stood the importance of that, too. So I've kind of just got these these great people that have been a great support to me. I want to I want to just start, you know, going and doing before and afters of, of you know, construction jobs and interviewing customers about navigating, uh, you know, the issues with insurance companies. And my friend Josh Grant, who's the claims manager, is just like a guru and like insurance companies will come in and, you know, they're like, oh, we're not going to pay for that. And Josh is like, oh, really? Well, actually, you are because and he's so good at what he does. So honestly, I'm just, I'm ready for some boring, beautiful, I want to make pretty sunsetty. I want to take my lenses. I want to make nice houses and hear nice stories and um, just get that out there. Um, and then, you know, this is just on the back burner a little bit for me, but I'm not going to give up on it. Uh, it was just more of a, you know, a mental health thing really and to get everything else in order. And if I could just one more thing, I'm sorry, it's just because we're talking about happy things. If we could talk about something sad for a second. Sure. 
When I saw the George Floyd video come out, my friend Chris Holbrook, by the way, is the chairman of the Libertarian Party. He was a victim of uh, police abuse, getting signatures, you know, back in like 2017. So he was very into this movement. So a lot of the times a protest happened, he'd send it to me and I'd get a lead and um, I'd be able to go get it. Um, he sent me uh, the video and, and saw it and I watched the video and when he asked for his mom, I had to turn it off. So I'm going to tell you that I never saw the video mm. until the cop got on all three charges and I saw someone uh, post something like, oh, it, you know, the mob kind of got their way and that's why they went after it. So I said, OK, I have to watch this. And I watched it. And like, I kind of got like a weird flash, like how was I able to operate in this when I didn't even know what really happened there? And like, how did the, maybe I, I was almost surprised that this, the cities didn't burn more because I saw that and I said, no decent human being is gonna be okay with that, you know, to see the whole thing. And I'm sorry, when I did watch it, and again, not being biased was a human being telling you, it, it looked like a cobra over their kill, you know, and just like the looks that were going on. And, and I thought how horrific, and I had never known. And like, really that was massive trauma expelled out to the world. Mm -hmm. And I think psychologically we need to be aware that there's, not only are you not informed by watching this propaganda, like it is literally detrimental to your health possibly. And I, again, I don't think censorship is the way to go, yeah. but I think education is the way to be going like, Hey, you're going to watch something that uh, is going to affect you in a certain way. And when I watched it, I felt like an idiot that I was able to walk around there thinking I could do whatever I want. Now, what I saw, what, what those organizers were saying and how they were describing it, I was like, Oh, wow, that really was bad. Um, but I like what you said. No, I don't hate anyone. I, I, I really like human beings. Police accountability is, that's where my film will probably go. Like you said, what have I done that I like the best? I think I'll follow where this goes because there's qualified immunity, um, liability insurance, um, the state lawsuit, doctors, if they like go in and like mess up too many people, they can't get insured. They can't offer it. And I think with the bad cop thing going on there. So again, that's me just telling you kind of where my, where my film is going, but I'm really excited to get back to happy stuff and, um, you know, taking beautiful pictures and sunsets and homes. And, and, and I want to do that for a little bit because you can't always be on the negative. You got to fuel up with no, the good stuff. You got to have some good stuff, right? You got to have some good stuff, but you know, it, this is this is real conversations. This podcast is is dedicated to real combos. It's interesting. We're, we're kind of going back to the George Floyd, but it's really fresh and it's a big deal. I mean, we're never going to forget this. You know, we have to remember. I think what ha we are so um, conditioned. I'm going to share a story on here that's I've never shared publicly. And I went to Haiti and served. Um, but we're so conditioned by everything to like. So I think we have this this we we have a divide. There's not. I think there's these two sides who see the video. And I think I understand a little bit hearing the way you just described it. It was horrific. Watching anyone die is horrific. Here's the problem. We are all conditioned to see this every day. Not, not that what we saw was nobody was like, oh, but we're instant to go, who's at blame? Wait, wait, wait. Somebody just died in front of our faces. We just watched him die. No matter what his background is, no matter what it is, take all that away. We just watched a person die. Look at how conditioned we are to not even think about that. We're thinking about everything else. Yeah. Who's right? Who's wrong? Political, this, this, we, we got so, and so here's something I'll share. This is a crazy story. So I go to Haiti and this is the conditioning part. Um, we were serving on a water truck. It was, it was an incredible experience. I, I, I loved it there. Beautiful people loved it. But I did see some things. I saw a lot of things. Um, I had a gun put to my head. I did not know it was being put to my head um, behind us while we were serving. Somebody had a gun and we were in the worst part of the world. Um, the worst and the best, I like to say. It was a beautiful place. Um, we were trying to serve water. Well, they need water and they were gonna maybe take it from us, right? Even though we were giving it. Um, and so that happened, we got walked away, it was fine. But we were in such a, 
the way you go into survival mode, you don't even think about it. You're like, oh, what's going on? We just walked oh, away. Yeah. yeah. So as we left, we were driving. We had to get out of there kind of quick. And it was just me and another person, woman with me and then the driver. And I had saw, saw someone in the ditch who clearly got hit by a car. And I said, did, and, and calmly, and it didn't even hit me. I just said, is that, did that person just get by the car? And he said, yes. And we kept driving. I said, they're going to die. And he said, oh, absolutely. And we just kept going. Hmm. And we couldn't stop. You have to understand because there were people that were probably following us. Do you understand that? And, and it was one of those moments where it took me a couple weeks and months to remember that. And I was like, I watched a person just die in front of me. Like that, that person was dying. I watched him get hit basically right after they got hit by a car and they were dying. And I was like, how did we just walk, just do that? You, we, we're so conditioned that and when you're in the moment as well, people don't get it. When you're in a moment, you don't think the same. It's mm -hmm. not the same. It took me like three weeks to process it. And I cried about it about three months later. Yeah. Like I finally <laughs> thought about it. I was like, wait a minute. That was horrible. That was horrific. <laughs> what I just saw, I, mean, I saw more things, but again, it wasn't a terrible trip. Nothing bad happened. We were all safe, but we saw a lot of horrific things, things that most people don't see. We live in a very beautiful place. And I, I hope people can take, even though we're in a really tough time, what I hope people can take from some of this is that we still have a beautiful place to live. We still have hope. We still have freedom. And I want to keep it that way. And that's what I pray for, you know? So yeah. bring me back and telling me that story. I've never told that story publicly, um, but it is very interesting when you're in it and then when you have to pull out of it. So it's very, it's, it's hard for people to understand. It, it, it's, I don't know if this is like for you, but it's like your brain is kind of taking care of you and numbing you and putting you on, on autopilot. And then later when you're kind of far away from it, you kind of more can take in the gravity of it all. Uh, I, yeah. I don't know if that's PTSD or something, but. Uh, like fight or flight. It's like fight or flight. You just go into this yeah. place. You're like, okay, let's keep going. How do we survive? Your brain puts you in survival mode. So you're like, okay, how do we survive this? Whoop, 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 and we yeah. do. And then all this, but then the repercussions of it is what happens later. And you do need to take breaks. You need to decompress. You need to kind of get out of that whoa you know and and it it is very intense i don't think people it's easy to watch stuff on tv i'll say that it's so easy to be over here and go well i saw it on here and have opinions and jump in and and i've been guilty of that i've had heavy opinions and i've gotten in arguments and i'm like but i wasn't there i don't know that feeling you don't know what it's like and until you're get in the ring. I always say that the Brene Brown, but it's not Brene Brown. She took it from, um, I want to say Roosevelt. I don't remember who said it, but, um, get in the ring until you're in the ring. You have no opinion. Yeah. You really don't. So if you're not in the ring, you really, you know, it's, it's great to be these keyboard warriors that we all see. And we see people getting into these fights. It's like, come on guys, if you're not in it, step back, take a breath. Think about it. Use, use this up here a little bit before you yeah, otherwise <laughs> you're just looking at the shadows on the wall, right? And, looking at the and shadows. Not seeing it. And the other thing you said about seeing this stuff on TV, I, I just hope the computerization of America, um, and I agree that more freedom is what we need, by the way. Not Because these countries, too, by the way, hitting with us, I think they think it's going to make us weaker, but I think as long as we stay more freedom and adjust to these things that are happening. I think it's gonna make us uh, a better country, but I would just add, let's not lose our empathy over watching these people you know, die over the screen because I think that's maybe another scary thing is that eventually we don't care because it comes becomes so uh, common yeah. and that you know we, we lose our humanity uh, in that regard too. Absolutely. This has been probably one of my favorite interviews, to be honest, is so, is so good to get your perspective. And that's why you've been on my list since the first day I did this podcast. I'm like, he's on my list. And I, I just, cause it's a side of me that I wish I want to talk more about. And it's hard because I wanted, you got to have people who are in it. Cause I don't want to have opinions on this. Like I want to have the real conversation with the person right there. So you got in the ring today. Thank you. You you've invited me into your world a little bit and all of our viewers, listeners and everything. So we know about the future. We've got your links. If people want to contact you for anything, maybe, you know, we've got millions of 
um, listeners on here. We're in countries all over the place. Uh, anyone that wants to contact you for anything, um, real quick, do you have a website or is there anything that you want? Yeah, it's uh, koalamedia.com. It's a little behind because I've been filming the revolution, obviously, on posts. But uh, otherwise, info at koala, K-O-W-A-L-A, media.com. But that's all on the website as well. I am Shiloh Ekstrom, and our guest, Matt Kowalski, today was incredible. Thank you so much. We'll be looking forward for that documentary that's going to go viral on Netflix one day. Okay. And I'll be watching. Okay, thank Thanks you. Thanks so much for having me.